Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar, The Perfect Trade Sale. My name is Kevin Uphill, and I'm the chairman of Avondale Corporate. So I'll be your host today, but I'll also be uh, running an initial presentation. I'm joined by my colleague, Simon Baldwin, uh, and we'll also be chewing the fact later on uh, in the session. We've got about 50 minutes, so I'd like to talk through some of the theory for the first 20, 25 minutes and then bring Simon in. And um, we'd also love to hear from you with some questions as we go and also for that later session. So you can see here, we just define the perfect trade sale, a maximum value strategic trade deal, prospery with buyers that just get it. Very easy to say on paper, but how can you achieve it? Uh, is it even possible? Let's examine. Well, first of all, for those of you who don't know us, um, we're focusing the talk today on what we call the emerging mid-market. So our speciality is the 1 million to 50 million uh, deal range, uh, and really, you know, the high quality end of the SME, what we call the emerging mid-enterprise. Mid the biggest drivers in the marketplace today are what we call the four corners of mergers and acquisitions. That's economies of scale, synergy, shareholder value, and positive disruption. There's a lot of money looking to do deals because people are finding it very difficult to get organic growth. Um, and therefore balance sheets are building up. Although, of course, we can all see that uh, there is a potential recession looming, so we need to understand the impact of that on trade buyers and M&A. But the big drivers, economies of scale, synergy, shareholder value, and positive disruption all sit well for trade buyers. So your ideal buyer will get all four of those. We're obviously looking for people with strong balance sheets, um, and the biggest driver that we're seeing in the market is positive disruption. And we need to come back to that to really understand what that is and what that means for you guys, uh, if you're thinking of selling or your clients, etc. Other drivers to the marketplace from a sale point of view, tax is still relatively benign. Capital gains tax, 10% on the first million, 20% to the second 10 million. Um, I'm not sure buyers have thought this through, but if they do shift that tax up, and there is talk about it moving to 40%, our own bet is 28%, but all it will do is increase value. So there is a window of opportunity for trade acquirers now uh, uh, if, if that tax is going to change. I think the other window of opportunity, surprisingly, um, London has now become a low cost center. Um, I quote that from a financial services client based in New York. Uh, I know it's difficult for us to understand that uh, um, if you're based near London with property prices and so on. But actually, if you look at exchange rates, um, because of the Brexit impact, uh, it is actually a relatively affordable global city and centre. And of course, that then spins out to the rest of the UK in terms of acquisitions. So perfect trade buyer. We actually already have a deal agreed, which hopefully we can announce soon uh, with a massive global American corporate and one of their key drivers is, is, is the exchange rate. But you need to find that buyer. We also need to understand what's going to happen in the market um, against uh, the potential recessionary forces that we see. In my own view, we will have a recession, two consecutive quarters um, of backward growth, uh, probably uh, running from September to early next year. Um, and I think the fundamentals of that, of course, we're seeing inflationary impact, uh, cost rising, uh, still got uh, with Brexit supply chain issues. Uh, we've got the Ukraine now, supply chain issues. Uh, I think that's all going to put brakes on the economy. But in terms of trade deals, where that would impact is if people didn't have money in the bank, but they, they have got money in the bank. And the second area where it would impact uh, is if they were just looking to buy against, uh, for example, shareholder value, i.e. themselves looking to sell very, in very, very near term. But the biggest deals and the best deals are actually being done on this positive disruption, which is where they're fundamentally changing the business model through the acquisition. And we need to understand that in, in, in more depth. So we remain very positive that trade will remain robust despite the potential recessionary forces. I'm also not convinced if there is a recession, it's going to be that deep. 
I don't believe that the banks have a lot uh, of scope in terms of raising interest rates. Um, but of course, that's pure speculation. Um, and I think if they don't do that, because of course the danger is you raise interest rates, households batten down, and then you've actually created the recession. Um, so whilst we want control inflation, I think they're more supply chain shocks than they are uh, uh, drivers to the recession itself. So m and should stay, trade buyers will keep looking, there's lots of money, positive disruption in centre stage. What do I mean by positive disruption? Um, well, I'll give you two examples. Uh, one is a deal that didn't happen, that should have happened. One is a deal that did happen and is possibly, from our own research, the best M&A of all time. Uh, the deal that didn't happen, they didn't positively disrupt themselves, was when Netflix went in and saw Blockbusters and they asked for 50 million and Blockbusters laughed. Now, Blockbusters, video chain store, now gone bust. Netflix had the future, they had the intellectual property, they had the team, they had the positioning. Blockbusters were arrogant, they couldn't get it, didn't see it. Uh, and that, that's a problem if you're going to approach trade buyers, because that very often happens. We very often have good trade conversations where we think, ah, oh, you know, this is a really important play for them. And the senior team just don't get it. So we need to, to get the perfect trade deal. We need to wrestle past that because you've got to convince people that yours is the right deal. Um, so they don't make the mistake blockbusters made. Another great example, positive disruption, and this is probably the best M&A deal of all time, when Google, uh, Alphabet bought Android, again, a £50 million transaction, oh, nice round numbers, we like that for our clients, uh, especially those sort of sums, uh, best M&A of all time. Uh, obviously, uh, Android, mobile phones, uh, Google have something like 70% of the market through their Android mobile phone platform. So it's, it was a huge play and 50 million is probably the best value play of all time. Interestingly, of course, neither of those businesses made money. They had good revenue, they had subscription revenue, had recurring revenue, but didn't make profit. So the valuation um, is not always about profit particularly if you've got a positive disruption argument when you're going in and talking to trade buyer. We should look at valuations. Um, Post-COVID, we're still working on the EBITDA model. So that's EBITDA, uh, looking at profits adjusted for owner's cost, but also adjusted for COVID. Uh, and increasingly that is being done on run rate in real time. Um, so it's very much what are the last 12 months being, what's the next 12 months being, rather than, oh, what's the last three years average? And the forecasts are increasingly important. So coming back to uh, persuading trade buyers, you've got to be able to provide management information in real time. Uh, we always coach our clients on this and we say, we need the up-to-date management account. It's really interesting. Some can do p &L, but they don't have the right balance sheet output. Some can do, um, quarterly but they can't do monthly so getting real-time management information is a key part of realizing shareholder value because it's so important in persuading trade buyers they they, they are very cautious uh, they will be looking at the EBAC, EBITDA model but you've really got to present that very carefully and accurately um, and unless it makes sense they, they won't do it we're not seeing any valuation increases. There were some around the beginning of 2021. I think, you know, the post COVID bounce, a lot of money was print, printed with the quantitative easing. Um, lots of um, private equity looking for home. People have got a bit more cautious. So I think values have now um, settled out. Typical price earnings ratios running from five to 10 uh, in the emerging mid enterprise with most sitting at six to seven. The biggest multiple influences are recurring revenue. So this is a reminder for you when you go into a, a deal on a trade basis on how you present your business. You, you know, we want to present uh, the key metrics in real time. We want to show that it's a team driven business. We want to show that it's not dependent on the management. We want to show it's got intellectual property, recurring revenue, barriers to entry. Um, and we also want to show how it's ahead of its competition. I think it's really important um, 
and we call it sort of blue ocean strategy. But a lot of people go into the room going, look, I've got a great business here, the numbers, but they can't articulate where they sit against the competitors and why they're better than the competitors. So a key point to getting the perfect trade deal is being able to articulate that research and analysis on where the business sits in the market and why it is ahead of others and therefore why it has that we want, we need motivation for, for the trade buyer. And for that, you've got to know your market, you've got to know your multiple influences, and you've got to present it correctly. So running into process, and that is about the presentation, if you like, so this is the process that we would typically import, employ or suggest is employed to find the perfect trade sale. Uh, step one, of course, is preparation. And for us, that's building a really high quality marketing data room. Yes, of course, we do information memorandum, but we like to keep them short form. Um, and that's because people have low attention spans. The information memorandum is for the MD. The data room is for the investment managers, the finance people, the accountants to make the real time decision based on the actual key presentation of the information. So forecasts, historics, really nicely laid out well analysed that people can see what it is they're buying and well presented along with uh, opportunity in terms of the market size and the growth prospects for the business. And of course the benefit of the marketing data room, every, every project we run an NDA on, but that means that you can go and talk to global buyers. We've already heard about exchange rates, so if it is a UK based business, um, it's a positive. Um, and therefore talking to Scandinavian, US, um, some European, we're not seeing um, much in Asia, although there are signs, I think, that India will reawaken its interest in UK acquisitions, um, but we haven't, uh, we haven't managed to complete any uh, uh, recently, but there are signs that that's, that might emerge. But America um, uh, and Europe, in particular Scandinavia, pretty active in the UK because of that exchange rate. So global research. And when you're looking at research, and I can't emphasize enough to get the perfect trade deal, research is at the heart of it. You really need to model what those buyer motivations are. Economies of sale, scale, yes, cost savings help. Synergy, the ability to cross sell, help. Shareholder value, are they themselves going to sell or are they trading at a higher multiple? And then, of course, positive disruption. What story have we got to present to buyers around those four corners? And how can we identify those buyers that get all four of those? Because if you get that, you'll get a higher tick in terms of multiple and interest. It's a busy world out there. I don't know about you guys, but, you know, I mean, we're all virtual now. We do everything on Teams and Zoom. And there is still not enough time in the day. Um, we are doing more deals, uh, but getting through to people is incredibly difficult. And again, another core key skill set to the perfect trade deal is making sure that you have multi-channel approaches to the right decision makers, the MD, FD in particular, uh, or head of m and if it's a big global corporate, and absolutely making sure you've got their attention. So emails, calls, Sometimes we have to revert to post, multi-channel, multi-approached. Uh, and also um, we, we do um, uh, multiple reach outs. It's quite interesting how on the second and third reach out, and you change the message each time that you actually get attention. People are hugely busy. It is difficult to get through. So ultra determined to those right trade buyers off the back of global research, Places like Pitchbook, Experian, Mark to Market, Ames, which is our own Avondale Information Management System, Tacit Knowledge, really carefully layered and then built on an iterative basis. So we don't launch all overnight, build it as you go so that you get uh, uh, project awareness being built uh, uh, on buy side. Of course, we then need to present really interesting. Uh, a lot of our sellers still believe you can persuade trade buyers. We don't. We think it's an influence job. It's about creating the right picture for them, but also spending more time asking what their strategy is. It, it's very difficult, we come back to those four corners, to measure 
where the buyer's motivations are. And of course, actually, if they've got a really high level of motivation, won't necessarily let you know that because for them, that undermines their negotiating position. So really careful research, not just of who, but of where they are and what other drivers they've got and what their current strategy is, and very, very good listening and questioning to try and analyze and understand that rather than talking at them. A lot of people still feel my job to persuade them, but actually I think it's an influencing job. We really want to understand them before we seek to uh, uh, persuade. We want to drive an auction. So of course the ideal perfect trade deal, and we do achieve this on the vast majority of our projects is multiple bids. Um, everything goes out on an office basis. You invite those multiple bids. Um, and therefore you create the auction to, 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 to drive the, the, the value. Uh, and typically on a project, we would get three to four bids um, and then be able to uh, gently play the parties off. I mean, it's really important. Some people see an auction as very much a, a timelined event uh, with best and final bids. Many corporate buyers don't like that um, and will actually walk away. So you've got to be very careful that it's a very gentlemanly auction and, and it can't all be about price as well. It has to be about deal structure, timing, ability to complete, um, and also the handover um, and the culture of the deal. Most trade transactions fail around culture where people have mismatched culture. So in that auction, it can't be a hard auction because you've got to assess all of those soft elements in the deal. Hard auction is just price and time, it has to be a soft auction because it's it's deal structure, handover, business plan, um, and, and shared vision uh, around culture. So, so it's very much, again, a listening auction rather than a uh, cold auction. Once you've gone to auction, you should get letters of intent, playing parties off, get to best price, get to best deal value, uh, and then agree terms. At that point, you will have to give exclusivity uh, because the buyer is going to be tracking a lot of resources at, at the project. We recently completed, in fact, we've done two, two recent trade deals in our data rooms. We convert the marketing data room into uh, a deal data room, a due diligence data room. We are now typically on most projects into 15 to 20 advisors. And one of the last ones we did, which was a big one, I think it was a 40 million pound deal. We actually had 50 people in the data room. That's ludicrous, but nonetheless, it's where we, we, we ended up. Um, but 15 to 20 is not unusual. Uh, both sides lawyers, both sides accountants. Um, and also most corporates will have a fairly heavyweight um, commercial team looking at it internally, which is typically five to six people. And they are really um, focused on due diligence. Trade buyers, uh, they're very much focused on doing acquisitions, uh, but they want high quality. And if you can't prove that high quality, then you will have difficulty. So better to go back to the preparation phase and be aware of what we've got and perhaps consider how we're going to pre prepare the business if we don't feel that we're in a position in real time to, to, to prove the quality. Again, I've got, um, I've got a corporate US buyer on a deal at the moment. We were scratching our heads because they were getting really excited about the fact that we didn't have insurance records for more than 10 years. And we're going, what? You know, statutory records are six years. And then we thought about it and thought, mm, actually it's construction related, asbestos, health and safety. That claim can go back for 40 years. That's why they want more than 10 years insurance records. But yeah, it's unbelievable the amount of information that is needed today to do a deal from a corporate compliance point of view. I have to say um, it's increased the value of our service because um, I would say compliance and due diligence has become in the last 10 years, 30 to 40% more cautious around whether it's GDPR, health and safety, employment, tax. Uh, so it's much more heavyweight and therefore you've got to have much more time and resource to handle those inquiries and create that picture. Of course, once you've got due diligence done, we're into the deal, final stage for getting completion. Again, that's become more heavyweight. Um, 
The legals tend today to be pushed back. They do commercial due diligence first, then legal due diligence, and then into the SBA. So a deal once agreed, we would have said it was probably three months. I would say with most trade buyers today, we're looking at four, four and a half months. And that's because we're not kicking into the legals until the back part of it. And of course, the sale and purchase agreement, uh, all about balancing risk uh, uh, in terms of warranties and indemnities. There's a big area that's also very much part of the due diligence now is the debt, cash and whole working capital cycle in the business. You can't just go into the room and go, ah, oh, well, we're cash generative. We've got a great EBITDA. They run it to the penny. You've got debt-free, cash-free, subject to normalised working capital, typically averaged over the last 12 months. Uh, it's quite complicated to agree. Um, all sorts of arguments about deferred incomes and accruals. So it becomes quite complex corporate finance accounting. Um, and I'm afraid you've got to go through it to get to that uh, perfect deal. A good advisor will do all the lifting for you and will win the big points and, and you know, trade on the small. One of the deals that we had with Trade Bar at the moment um, got really uh, heavyweight accountants. I think they began with a B and then a G. I'll let you figure out who they are. But they had 14 people on it, came in really hardball with a very aggressive working capital position. And we just simply went, well, guys, we don't disagree with that. But what you're missing is that in the four months you've agreed the deal, our company's grown. And that's why it needs more working capital. The EBIT dials up and therefore you should be paying higher on the price. So you can't have it both ways. You can't keep the price the same and then get deal attrition by forcing us to keep more working capital in the business. So we fought back on the EBIT dial. And the point of that story is when you're negotiating, it's not always fighting in straight lines. It's about strategy and thinking how you're in the best position to win. We were not going to win against 14 uh, from a top tier accounting firm that had analysed it to the ninth degree on working capital. They had it right. So we fought in a different area. And that, of course, is negotiation. Trade deals are more likely to be all cash, unless, of course, they are private equity funded trade deals. Um, we do a lot of research around that. There's something like, I think, 200 emerging mid-market private equity firms in the UK, all invested five, 10 plus companies, portfolio businesses. Most of them are looking to acquire. Um, they will structure deals, but big corporates, if you can get it right and you can prove that positive disruption, may well pay all cash because earnouts um, undermine uh, their ability to absorb the business. Uh, and create the change to, to their business model. Some corporates, if they're aim listed, will still look to do shares. Um, that's fine, but of course, we've got to underwrite them. Uh, right now, of course, not convinced by NASDAQ shares. We had an offer probably six or seven months ago uh, from a NASDAQ listed. They are 30% where they were um, seven months ago. So NASDAQ has dropped, but that company has also dropped. So that's a double hit. So shares can go up as well as down. So we've got to be very careful about that. Trade will look at deferred and earn outs. Um, but as I say, for them, often it's potentially more deferred than earn out because an earn out makes it very difficult for them to merge the business in. I just want to go back to one key point before we sort of wrap up and bring in some questions. So please, if you're thinking now, if you've got questions, fire them into the Q&A. We'd like to try and address those. Um, but uh, I heard a great quote the other day. Um, I think it was private equity. Uh, and it, it also could be summed up for venture capitalists. And, and it, was, it was this. Great story, bro. Prove it. Now, I love the street talk behind it. But if anything sums up where trade buyers and investors are right now, it is that. They want to do stuff. They've got the money but they are increasingly cautious around compliance and around forecast and around sustainability. Um, and, and also ethical, um, you know, ESG is growing within that thought process. So you really can't 
go out and find those deals without having properly prepared the business so it is robust and fit for purpose and surviving that. So if I use an analogy, you know, the old days you could sell a house and, you know, the surveyors would sort of have a quick look at the outside. Now, absolutely, you know, you need the environmental assessment, you know, is a boiler the latest technology? Is it going to need upgrading? What's the spec? So we use an analogy, you know, you could have bought a 7 Series, which was a high spec car. Today, even in the emerging mid-market, a compact, a 3 Series, you still accept, expect the same level of spec and the same level of build quality. And corporates will not buy SMEs or EMEs, emerging mid-enterprises, without uh, that quality there. And other emerging mid-enterprises are also cautious about acquisitions. They want to do it because they understand the shareholder value uh, play for themselves, i.e. if they buy a company and they're trading at a multiple of five or six, they buy at a multiple of five or six, they get multiple arbitrage, can they sell out a multiple of seven or eight? But again, ultra cautious about quality, particularly around the quality of your management and how they drive the growth of that business and the recurring revenue streams. So one of the big areas people fall over, they have a finance manager, not a finance director, uh, and they can't output the real-time numbers. Cost per acquisition of client, average lifetime of client, um, current gross profit margin, P&L, balance sheet, all in real time. You need to be able to prove what they're buying is sustainable and going to continue to be sustainable. We've already talked a bit about negotiation. I do think it's really important. Buyers tend to think that they're better than sellers because on the whole, they tend to be bigger. Uh, and you can use that arrogance to your advantage. Um, they tend to have, however, uh, and I call it third party referral strategies, but we were dealing with a Japanese corporate not so long ago. And the MD, even though in the UK they had 700 people, everything was referred to, I'll use a, a name, Mr. Samito, it wasn't that, but we might as well. Um, and it was very much, we couldn't get to some Mr. Samito. And that, that's, that is a strategy that's deliberate. And so we constantly had third party referral in the negotiation strategy. Important point about that is, that story is you need to change your game to understand how you're going to, you know, counter that. Um, but or at least be aware that that's the strategy they're employing. Um, negotiation is about strategy um, and it's about anticipating the moves that your other player is going to make. Um, one of the other great ones corporates love doing is absolutely charming. Um, again, we've got a small company, uh, big corporate looking at one at the moment. It's got great IP. That's why they're interested. We know that. Um, they can scale it up. Oh, my God, they are absolutely going out of their way to charm those sellers. But, of course, charm doesn't necessarily equal a good price. Um, and you just need to be aware that that's a strategy. Final point on all of this, perfect trade sale, obviously right buyer, right research, right dialogue, right presentation of information, right deal structure, and then of course the right handover. So you need to look at what you're trying to achieve. Got a great picture here of the golf course. Um, now, probably if it's a trade deal, the golf course is more likely. Uh, if it's a trade deal backed by private equity, you might be able to retain a stake. But most sellers, even with a handover, don't survive the cultural challenge. Um, and that creates its own issue. Um, many sellers experience grief, particularly at the level we're dealing at, you know, deals of 2 million to, 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 to 30, 50 million. People are not necessarily um, going to be in need of the money in the future, but they've lost that sense of purpose in their business goal. Um, Time and time again, we talk to people who have gone, no, oh, it's fine, I'm going to be playing golf, and a year later, bored. Now, that's not an issue, so long as you know that's the cycle that you're likely to go through. Um, and I'm aware of one group uh, where they went through this, and they got three or four of them together, 
and they meet every month and they just call it the old man rant strategy by the way there is a lady there as well but they get together and they talk about you know economies with RFAs um, and they have a bit of a rant and they do that so they can bounce off each other because they miss the cut and thrust of business um, and they're very aware that they do that um, but the point of that is they can then share stories of what's working for them and what, what's not. One of the big areas I think sellers go wrong, they've got this money, they don't know where to get a yield. They uh, believe that they are very strong at business. They get bored and often start again, ignoring the fact that the market has changed or in a slightly different area. And oh my word, they find it incredibly difficult. We normally find the successful sellers are the ones that don't business angel. They work hard to get a private equity network who give stronger yields than standard investment managers. They split their investment, 50% property, 50% uh, professional managers. And then they look for other ways to stay engaged other than staffing companies. And that way they preserve their wealth. So it's just important to ask this question, what are you going to do after a trade deal? Because working with the buyer may prove incredibly difficult. Not impossible. Uh, Alphabet, Google have retained out of their deals. I think it's 140 of the founders uh, of 180 that they've done. But they're culturally very different to the average uh, uh, trade buyer. So I think just go in with your eyes open. Now we've got some questions coming in. Simon, can I ask you to join? Um, welcome. Um, so I'm just going to stop sharing for a second and then we, we can come back on in a second with that. Um, Simon, what do you like? What don't you like about what I've said? What, <laughs> what have I got yeah. right? What have I got wrong? Yeah, and I think you covered it pretty well. I think there's, there's some good questions coming in as well, which we can look at in a second. I think one of the big areas we, we touched on there, um, getting our numbers right, getting us robust um, when we're presenting the business to the market is obviously, you know, as an advisor out there, it's a challenge to make sure clients have got all of that um, in good line. And I think, you know, one of the biggest takes for, for, for clients or indeed advisors acting for clients is, you know, a lot of them have got, you know, perhaps a finance manager, have they got an FD? Have they got a really, really experienced strategic FD in place? that is really sweated those numbers through not just forecast but through the cash flow ideally with a with a balance sheet um, that all links up for the next three years and if you make an adjustment it all automatically adjusts the answer to that for a lot of our clients still today when we meet them is they're not really quite at that point some are occasionally but i think a lot still need a lot of work in that area they know their business they know how to run it and it's being run well but it's very different from when you're presenting it to somebody who isn't in the business. You know, you're going out to the market. You really want to show you're absolutely in control of the future and where you're heading. And actually, if certain changes come along, this is the effect of the numbers. And you can demonstrate that straight away. So I would really push that, you know, where it's all possible, as we do, you know, get that level of work done to the nth degree. Um, is a key key component when we're, we're presenting that alongside the, the business plan of where the business is heading, of course. Can I, well, can I link to that, Simon? Because we, you say we've got some great questions. There's, there's one in here from uh, Tim Sadka, um, who's yep. a very good corporate lawyer, I think, if I remember correctly. Tim, welcome. Um, ESG, um, quite interesting, because certainly, it, it's 20, I think it's 25 million plus, not, not 50 million is his question. We have seen it uh, 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 coming forward. Ethical social government. I think... It is becoming far more important again. You sort of come back to the point I made earlier about compliance in deals um, and the heavyweight due diligence, but they, they are looking at everything from supply chains to environmental, um, to employment history, you know, uh, the whole culture of the team. Um, what's your view on ESG? Do you think it's gonna become an even bigger thing in deals? Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think, it, you know, where businesses sit socially or environmentally, you know, corporate governance, I think is important um, or becoming more important. I think people want to see that businesses are, are doing their bit in all aspects um, where they sit within the market. It isn't all just, you know, capital making money or that's an, what, what we're in it for. But I think it, it adds to that where businesses are, are, are positioned in, in what they're trying to achieve in 
in the marketplace and doing the right thing going forward. And you know, if that crosses over into environmental, you know, some businesses more than others, or social impact, etc., it is important to look at. I think small business owners or emerging mid-market underestimate the level of presentation they need to have. And um, owners assume they can carry on the same, which is often, you know, they, they work, you know, 60, 70% in the business, not on it still doing a day job if you like of some description and therefore they don't allow enough time for this you know whether it's ESG or proving forecasts what what's your reaction to that uh, sorry you cut out there Kevin apologies oh, right. well, I'm sorry um I, I was saying um so when we look at um uh, so we had a question, Simon, by the way. Who is Simon Baldwin? You're, you're one of our lead M&A advisors. Sorry, I, I'm just uh, presenting that. I was saying that I don't think sellers are often too hands-on in a business and they don't understand the need to be hands-off and have more time to present all of this because they don't really, they underestimate the level of detail that's required, whether it's ESG or forecast. Yeah, absolutely right. I think that, that is, that again, is probably the next big challenge. A lot of our business owners are, are you know, either fully or semi-involved in the business. And that's very difficult for them to step back. And the kind of wood for the trees scenario is really step back strategically and look at it very much through a buyer's eyes. You know, that, that would be the biggest lesson there is just really stepping back, trying to step away just from the operation of the business and much more around looking at it from a helicopter point of view. Yeah, absolutely key. And if they can, you know, reposition their time, of course, that, you know, some other questions that have come in here, which I think are hugely relevant to, but if you're, you know, if you're less involved in the business, that's going to have an impact, positive impact potentially if you've got strong management in place on the structure of the deals as well, which we'll move on to in one of the questions that we've got in here. Well, shall we take that one? So what are you seeing typically in terms of earnouts versus the proportion of sales that have an earnout, and what are these earnouts typically in terms of time and future payment percentages and performance measures? Yeah, and I think that's a really good question. And of course, there is no one answer to this. Often, as in the, in the M and A world, um, there are different ways of coming at this. But uh, but it, you know, to answer that question roundedly, you know, if you took the the, the typical and the black answer would probably be expecting about seventy percent of your money on up front and about thirty percent um, earned out probably over a couple of years. That would probably cover as an answer more deals than not, if uh, as a majority answer. But the, re the real answer is it, it, it depends. You know, it's a highly variable position from deal to deal where, you know, some uh, uh, earnouts might be 50% amount of money up front and others might be nearly all of the cash on day one as, as, a, as a rare scenario, but it does happen in some of our deals. So, um, you know, the proportions vary. And I think going back to the point, you know, one of the reasons it might, might vary um, it is in owner involvement, how strong the management team are that are being retained with the business. Of course, a load of other factors involved there, um, reoccurring revenue, strength of the consistency of the business, continuity of the business going forward. How robust is it? You know, going back to those cash flows and forecasts to support that evidence um, and then the information that's in the days from to show that that journey is likely to be sustainable. Um, so I think, you know, and, and, and the strength of the marketplace that that business is in. So th there's a whole list beyond there why one business might get less of an earn out structured deal and another, another one might get more. Of course, the other aspect that can be a positive to have an earn out is if you've got a very fast growth business, the value today, of course, could be considerably less than it might be in three years. And that might be an un, slightly unknown journey. So a buyer is not prepared to pay all of the money today and the seller is not prepared to sell it at a low price today. So you arrive at a structured deal that works for... That's for a very price. important point, Simon. I think we're seeing, we're seeing a trend also with very good quality corporates and or conglomerates, if you like, buying and holding harmless. So they're, they're, they are not merging and integrating the business. They're, they're buying it, uh, holding the brand, use, uh, taking the back office and, and the intellectual uh, you know, property, but allowing the business to trade separately. A, because they then get an earn out, which means that the deal is cheaper value. Uh, B, because there's too much going on. They don't want to damage the business in terms of merging it and all the change management that that occurs. Um, and, and C, it makes it easier to get rid of that cultural clash that occurs. If you, you know, top management here and top management there, both think they're the best and squabbling over who is actually the best. Um, so I think, 
Some corporates have caught on to the idea of behaving a bit more like private equity. So you buy and you gently merge. And I think that's going to be an emerging trend uh, in, in, in the sector we're, we're having, which, which puts earnouts in a more plausible position because you just can't do earnouts if it's merged. It's really difficult. Um, so I think that's important. Um, we've, got so another, we've, yeah. got, we've had some other questions. Um, are banks still lending? Yeah, we've got that in there and, I'll, and, 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 you know, what's the sort of trade interest in the marketplace out there at the moment? And I think it's pretty strong still. I, I think um, you know, banks are lending. I thought, of course, cautionary to it as, you know, to, as the market becomes tighter, you know, or is there a more recessional, um, you know, events on the way? We'll have to wait and see. But I think, you know, ultimately at the moment, the right deals are well supported. Um you know, that of course, comes down to buyer profile as much as the target profile. Um, but in our experience at the moment, you know, we've got lots of deals and activity, quite frankly, going on and all being very positively supported financially. Uh, but I think due diligence is strong. I think it's fair to say yeah. that, that, you know, there'll be a lot of time and effort put in, you know, from lawyers acting on behalf of banks as, as well as lawyers acting on behalf of um, and key advisors acting on behalf of the actual acquirers to look at, um, you know, the robustness of that business going forward very, very carefully. And we've got, I was talking, we've got, I know, Shawbrooks or FinCat specialist lenders that are really keen to lend, typically two, maybe three times uh, EBITDA at the very high end, but they will put in their own accountants to do due, due diligence. It's not just the commercial guys checking now, they will do their own form of FDD. Um, typically six to seven percent. I had uh, one question of them, of, you know, recession, and they're very clear. This is not like 2008-9 where they literally did stop lending overnight. Yes, we've got inflation with pressures. We can all see a potential recession, but they don't want to be the cause of it. They're going to carry on lending. They've got the money and they need to do so. But as you say, they're fussy. They want to check it. Um, how do you keep trade buyers honest and make sure they don't take all the sensitive information and go off into the sunset, especially if they're doing commercial DD first? Great question uh, from Nick. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think that's part of what, how the, your advisor acts for you as to what information is in that data to start with. <clears throat> you know, if, and sometimes, I mean, you know, we, we at Ender, we will run sometimes even two data rooms occasionally, sometimes to information memorandums, but um, you know it, that are in that data around that sensitivity of information that's in there. And you know, for a simple examples, it might be the client names are not something that that our, our client wants to to make transparent. You know, then they'll be anonymised. Um, sometimes it's it's beyond there, and it's even you know clients within certain industry sector that we would talk around less to those specific trade bars. So I think it is case by case. It is on a bespoke basis. To protect that that position of, and of course, you know, the time there comes a time when you are releasing that information. But I think that's once it becomes more serious. The deal is agreed. We've gone quite a long way down the road. The lawyers possibly instructed at that phase. Um, so it's a much much tighter confidentiality approach and in the exclusivity with that bar. But certainly the early stage, totally get that question. It's a very valuable one, and you've got to manage it case by case carefully. Yeah, phase the information and no, not yet is a, is a good line, isn't it? No, not yet. Rather than no, never. No, not yet. Uh, uh, we've had, do you see buyers helping to put things in place to proactively get engage and retain employees from the firm they're buying? One worry for me is that my employees will be spooked and leave during an hour impacting us financially. Yeah, this is about cultural fit as well, I think. it's and, and it is a timing point as well, that there are no absolutes. I mean, one of the answers, you know, standard answer you, you typically hear in the M&A world, I think, is we'll make the announcements um, at completion when the deal's done, so it, it's a fate of complete. That is all well and good, but I think if you've got key employees that are wholly important to the business moving forward, you know, from a bar's perspective, they don't want them leaving, of course, as much as the, the seller may not, particularly if there's an earnout involved, and commonly there is of some sort. It's crucial that it works for everybody. So often key employees, once the deal's agreed as part of due diligence, those key employees will be brought in um, as part of meeting the buyer together with the seller to talk around and have an open discussion about where this journey may lead um, and the positives of it. Because I think 
the spook getting absolutely highlighting on that word spooks is often they're getting spooked because this is going to be a bad journey, not a good journey. So it's got to be laid out and, and discussed with these key employees that actually it is a good journey because those key employees, once they're motivated, that'll trickle down to the team and it's and, it, and it's all positive. So the bringing the right people in at the right time, again, case by case is bespoke and, and that's around um, consulting with our client and our bar, what we all agree makes sense, uh, is, a, is a good commercial decision to do so. Well, that's great summary, Simon. So just mindful of time, uh, just sort of bring us to a close if that's all right. So I just want to share a screen one more time with an announcement from, from us as well. But um, really the offers there, you, we've got uh, myself and Simon's contract details coming up in a second. So please, please email us if you want to continue the dialogue and you have any more questions. Um, a perfect trade sale is possible. Um, it's got tougher. Uh, and the answers to how you deal with that better data, better research, and more questions of what the buyer strategy is so you fit within it. So it's entirely doable within that uh, uh, equation, um, but you have got to put more time and effort into it. And of course, we, we then contend quality in terms of advisors throughout your team and resources in, in, in doing that. Trade buyers uh, have to buy companies. They're not getting organic growth. They're also not necessarily great at innovation. Um, they're not particularly agile, um, and not, not always. And so buying small companies is a great way for them to change their business model. Um, something like 70% of CEOs in a recent survey said that a, a, a Fortune 500 company said they intend to use M&A to change their business model. The vast majority of them are aware that they're not necessarily far enough ahead in digital and tech, for example, and they're looking at how they can adjust their model around these areas to create scale up and they're going to use that position to do it. So some really good conversations out there. People are nervous, however, when they move into the emerging mid enterprise because, you know, quality pays. So you've just got to present that. And on that point, quality is driven by knowledge. So just a sort of quick update from, from us, if you've enjoyed today, we will be recording this webinar. It will be going live on our website. Uh, a big change we made to our website recently. We have absolutely loads of content, um, probably 15 to 20 webinars, three or four podcasts, uh, 10 guides, loads of articles, which is all great CPD for advisors and owners around the subject of M&A, whether you're buying, selling, uh, or looking at all your exit options, etc. So finance, funding, it's all there. Please, please, please take a look. It's all educational. You'll learn a thing or two, we hope. Uh, that's on our knowledge base, um, and it's done in, in, in date order as we release it. But the, I think it's probably over 50, 60 different bits of high quality content. So please, please look at that. We've, we've opened that up for you and all your partners to look at. We will record the webinar. Uh, we are happy uh, to share also the Q&A answers that we've got. So we'll share that out uh, uh, later. We've got um, an upcoming uh, um, couple of webinars as well. Um, July the 21st, negotiating the best price for your business, and then a bit of exploration on the 22nd of September uh, for, for private equity. There's mine and Simon's details, so please email us if you've got any questions as we go. Simon, thanks for your help this morning. I hope it's been useful uh, uh, for you. I'll just leave you with the last word, Simon. Perfect trade deal. Um, what's yeah, deal? I think, I think you know culturally as well as commercially is the key. You know, does it and, and does it make strategic sense overall? Is 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 absolutely right. And, and then finalising behind that is get the right team behind you to make sure it it, it works and, and has success. Thank you.